This is the third lecture. We're going to talk about Genesis and the flood. So we're going to try to speed it up a little bit. We've been kind of going slow. We're going to... Just kidding. I haven't talked about the material yet. I'm going to offer the material for $12, and uh, that includes the Creation Science Crash Course Manual. Ooh, everyone wants this. It's basically a series of articles that we've picked out for each lecture, and uh, they sort of go along with each lecture. Uh, we've got the, the Evolution Handbook. This is great. If you're curious about carbon-14 dating or anything, you can go into the back. And you can say, oh, carbon-14 dating. Oh, that's on page 800. And you can go there, and you can read about it. So it's a great resource. And then we've got these uh, informational tracks. I used to give out 21 of them because I can get them for 25 cents a piece. Now they cost me 50 cents a piece, so I'm going to only offer 10 of the best ones. I usually include a You Can Be Sure tract written by uh, Bob Wilkin. You can get it from gracelife.org. Let's get started. This presentation, we're going to talk about pre-flood. What was the pre-flood environment like? How big were the animals? Bugs? Was there any sort of different water cycle then? Act two, a flood of biblical proportions. We'll see if the atheist's allegations hold any water. And act three, after the flood. And we're actually not going to get to this today. We're going to get to it next week. I want to remind you guys that there's a difference between theories and truth. You should be dogmatic about truth. You should be dogmatic about God's word. You should not be dogmatic about theories. A lot of creation science are theories trying to explain truth. And so the boundaries get a little bit blurred, but you should always be dogmatic about God's word. A theory is an assumption based on limited information or knowledge. It's a conjecture. Remember how we said we don't know everything? And if you knew everything, then you wouldn't have to have theories because you'd know it. Man's theories are based on limited information. The truth is based on infinite information. God has infinite information. His understanding is infinite. That's what Ecclesiastes says. So God's word is absolutely true. Science can be divided into two different categories, observational science and historical science. A lot of people don't realize this. Observational science is repeatable. You step on the scales, and you step on different scales. And depending on the accuracy of the scales, you can get the same result every time. Historical science is different. Historical science deals with origins, stuff that happened one time, you can't go back and redo it and test it over and over again. And so the Big Bang Theory, which we're going to talk about in the last lecture, and evolution are in the realm of historical science. It's non-repeatable. So presuppositions and biases are very, very important with historical science. Fortunately, the flood, all those types of events in scripture, are in the realm of historical science, but because we believe God's word is inspired, we know that it's absolutely true. So we don't have to sit there and question, is it true or not? Okay, pre-flood, also known as antediluvian. Anti meaning before diluvian, deluge, before the flood, before the water came. Humans and animals were herbivores before the fall. I think we can definitively say that. As best we can tell, that's true. And then after the fall, after Adam and Eve sinned, animals started eating each other. Genesis 1.29 says, And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. So we have animals and man eating originally plants. That was what was given for food. And I had a, had a teacher one time a few years back say, Well, that doesn't mean that God didn't also give them meat to eat. And at the time, I didn't have a good answer for that. But a lot of people say that just the fact that animals have claws and teeth indicates that they were designed to eat meat. Can you tell whether, some, whether an animal eats meat by its teeth? Well, you'd think you could, but is this a carnivore or an herbivore? No, it's an herbivore. It eats gum trees. And God designed it to eat plants. And what God designed it to do, I think it does do well. Here's another one. Carnivore or herbivore? It's got big old nasty looking teeth. Carnivore. Oh, so close. It's a Jamaican fruit bat. It's real good at eating fruit. Just because an animal has claws and teeth doesn't mean that it was designed to be a meat-eating animal. Genesis 9.3, when the teacher asked me, he said, well, it doesn't say that he didn't give them meat to eat. I think that if God had originally given Adam and Eve and the animals meat to eat, this wouldn't make any sense. Genesis 9.3 says, every moving thing that, and this is after the flood, right after he'd gotten off the ark, God, decided, God said, I'm going to change things a little bit. And he said, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. I don't think this would make sense if Adam and Eve weren't designed to be plant eaters before the flood. 
I'm not going to preclude the possibility that some of the non-believers, because man's heart was filled with evil continually right before the flood, that some of them ate meat. I'm sure they probably did. We don't have any evidence for that one way or another. Jesus 9.2 says, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Apparently, the animals weren't afraid of man, which is another clue that man probably wasn't regularly hunting them down and eating them. Just lots of clues here. Also, the restored creation in Isaiah 11, which I've talked about before, you have the wolf lying down with the lamb, the cow and the bear will graze, the lion will eat straw like an ox, and the toddler will put his hand in the viper's den. And so you have vipers not eating meat, you have tigers not eating, wolves not eating meat, you have bears not eating meat. So all of these seem to indicate that God originally intended us not to kill things and eat it. Although it's okay now because he said we could. And it's, there's nothing like a good grilled piece of meat with some sizzled fat. Another clue that we have is from Genesis 3-7. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Right after Adam and Eve sinned, they thought, oh no, what have we done? And they, they chose to try to cover themselves and to make a way for themselves to get by. Maybe God won't know. Maybe he, won't, maybe he just won't ask, and we just, the whole thing will blow over. And so they made fig leaves. Why did they choose fig leaves? It seems like an awful solution. And how long do you think those things are going to last? One day? Six hours? I don't think they'd last very long at all. It seems a lot more likely if they're killing animals that they probably would have used a hide of some sort. I think he was trying to brush the whole thing over. And when God came around and said, Adam, where are you? He hid himself. And God said, well, why are you hiding? He said, well, because I'm naked. And, uh, and God said, well, who told you you were naked? He said, well, the, the, uh, the serpent deceived Eve, and Eve gave me this fruit. And, uh, and, and God said, well, well, what are you doing with these clothes on? And they said, well, it's a pretty bad solution. I'm making that up, but... And so basically God provided an animal for them. He took Adam and Eve, and I imagine, it doesn't say this, but I imagine that he probably killed the animal in front of them. That was probably the first time that they had seen an animal die. And I imagine Adam was thinking in his mind, oh no, God has killed an animal for our sins. And uh, so anyways, this, it was a foreshadowing of the atonement of Christ. And uh, Christ isn't just, doesn't just cover our sins, he pays for our sins. 1 John 2, 2 says Christ is the propitiation, the satisfactory payment, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the world. So it's a, it's a direct foreshadowing in Genesis of, of Christ. So next, let's talk about the waters above and the waters below. It seems like there's something different in Genesis written about these. Let's talk about the waters below first. Genesis 2, 6 says, But waters come out of the ground and water the entire surface of the land. There's something different about the uh, hydrologic cycle before the flood. This one seems to allude to that. 2 Peter 3, 5 says, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in water. What's this? Out of water and in water. Psalm 21, 4. And there's actually a lot of interesting things in the Psalms that David makes allusions to. I kind of wonder what kind of documents he had access to back then. Makes you wonder. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Psalm 139, 6. And to him who spreads out the earth above the waters, for his steadfast love endures forever. So the earth is above the waters. The current theory, and I think it's a pretty good one, is that there was a subterranean water chamber underneath the earth. And when the flood occurred, this the crust cracked open, and that water came gushing out. We'll talk about that a little bit more next week. Genesis 1, 6 through 8 says, And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse and called the expanse heaven. So now we're going to talk about the waters above. What were the waters above? Psalm 148.4 said, Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. How many heavens are there? There are three heavens. There's where the birds fly, there's where the stars reside, and there's where the angels and God is. And so what does it mean... Praise him, you highest heavens and waters above the heavens. Well, there's a couple of theories about that. The canopy theory was a real popular theory for the past 20 or 30 years or so. And I think it's it's a good theory in a way. But basically it says that that there was some sort of uh, spherical shell of water that was surrounding the atmosphere. The second theory is uh, Dr. Humphrey's theory. And 
1996, Dr. Humphreys came up with the first Christian, self-consistent, Bible-based cosmological model. He basically says that there were waters outside, not just outside of our solar system, but outside sort of enveloping the universe. <laughs> it's an interesting thought. I, I, there's no way to prove it. It's a theory. And as all good theories, I, I appreciate the, the effort and the thought into it. Uh, but we, we really can't be dogmatic about this kind of stuff. But it is interesting. There are several reasons for believing in the canopy theory. Number one, the source of water for the floodgates of heaven. Because you've got two sources of water, the floodgates of heaven and the fountains of the deep. And then number two, water's above from water's below. So we have that separation in scripture. And there's a cost for increased concentration of oxygen content. And number four, uh, which you don't really have to have an increased concentration of oxygen. But number four, protection from harmful UV radiation, which can account for long lifespans. Okay, people are living a long time, and most of the degeneration in our genetic code is due to UV radiation. There is one significant and unignorable problem with the canopy theory. Number one, it's not directly taught in scripture. And number two, a vapor canopy holding more than seven feet of rain would cause the Earth's surface to be intolerably hot. So a vapor canopy could not have been a significant source of the floodwaters. Okay, I happen to believe that. I think the calculations are really well defined. There's sort of a modification of the canopy theory. And it sort of comes partly from Josephus' book. Josephus was a famous Jewish historian, and he was known for being incredibly accurate. In the siege on Jerusalem in 68 to 70 AD, he did a... The, the reason we have so much information about that is because of Josephus. He says this, After this, on the second day, he placed the heaven over the whole world and separated it from the other parts and determined it should stand by itself. He also placed a crystalline firmament around it. So he mentioned a crystalline firmament. And because he was so accurate, his words hold a lot of weight. Larry Vardaman suggests that much of the waters above could have been stored in small ice particles distributed in equatorial rings around the earth similar to those around Venus. It's a good theory. I have nothing wrong with it. So we don't know whether that's true or not. Next up, how could pre-flood people possibly live for so long? Good question. Uh, the average age of people before the flood was 912 years. Today, we typically live 70 or 80 years. And that doesn't include Enoch, because Enoch would bring that average up, right? He, he's still technically alive. Some people got the bright idea, well, I don't believe people could live that long, so maybe those aren't years, maybe they're months. Genesis 5.12 says, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. That would make Enoch five and a half years old when he fathered Methuselah. That is a miracle. So I, I obviously don't believe that. There was a good article in Answers to Genesis written by Carl Weiland called Living for 900 Years, and he says this, when your DNA splits, it forms chromosomes, and these chromosomes look like an X. And at the tips of the X, there's these things called telomeres. And every time a cell divides, the telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter. And it's like a biological clock. And when they get so short, the, the cell basically can't divide anymore. And here's what Carl Weiland says. The telomeres shorten with each cell division. Once the limit is reached, the cells can no longer divide. There's no biological reason at all why people could not live much longer than they do at present if they had the appropriate genetic makeup. There are cells that can divide infinitely. They're cancer cells. There, there's a lady that had cervical cancer in the early 1950s, and 50 years later, they were still growing her cells, and they actually used her cells to map out the human genome 50 years later. So these cells divide and divide and divide and divide. There's no limit to how many times they can divide. A better question might be, why don't we live that long anymore? Why do our cells have a biological clock built into them? Okay, I think it's part of the entire creation being frustrated, Paul talks about. There's several reasons for shortened post-flood lifespan, and I believe the major factors are genetic. Uh, there was a genetic bottleneck at the flood. You have the entire population of billions, possibly, being reduced to eight people. And so who is Shem, Ham, and Japheth's children going to marry? Their cousins. Okay. And that's going to cause a shortened lifespan. So immediately after the flood, you go from living 900 years to living 400 years for the first few generations. And so, and then, after the first few generations, you have Babel. And God confuses their speech, and you have these people being sent off into family groups. Who are the family groups going to marry? Probably their cousins. <laughs> okay? They're isolated from each other. I know it's not a pleasant thought, but that's most likely what they did. And so, you, you, several, for about four generations, starting with Peleg, it says the earth was divided in the days of Peleg. 
and that may be a reference to, to the Tower of Babel, you immediately have another drop in age from 400 years to 200 years. So we get 900 years to 400 years, going, starting at the bottleneck happening in the flood. And you go from 400 years to basically 200 years at Babel. That seems to indicate that most of the factors are genetic. And you have accumulation of genetic mutations gradually shorten people's life. Minor factors are environmental, and some people try to make it sound like it's all environmental. Certainly the environment changed going from pre-flood to post-flood, but I do not believe the major factors to shorten lifespan are environmental. Some of the environmental factors are post-flood increase in toxins and nutritional changes after the flood. If the lifespan was purely environmental, then why did Shim live another 500 years? It seems like if it was environmental, he would have only lived 200 years. And also, it's another interesting point that Shim basically lived at the same time as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he actually died after Abraham. It's interesting. We'll talk about more of that, Dinosaurs and Ancient Man. We're going to go through some of the history. There's a great book called Buried Alive written by Jack Cuso. He actually went over to Europe and investigated a lot of the skulls from Neanderthal men and the other people that were supposed to be half ape, half human. And he went and looked at Les Moustiers and La Chapelle of Saints. He basically says this, In this case, I would estimate we are talking about over 300 years in both cases for these Neanderthal men. And he says that, and we're going to talk about more about this in Dinosaurs and Ancient Man, but he says that based on some of the features of the skulls, and some, there's rickets and arthritis in some of the bones of the Neanderthal men. And just knowing how bones grow over time, you can sort of extrapolate it out that these were very, very old men. So it's really interesting research. But as historical science, <laughs> it's, it's, we shouldn't necessarily hold dogmatically to it. So what was the pre-flood environment like? Mm, good question. It was lush and green. Isaiah 45, 18 says, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He established it, he created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. The earth today is 72% water. Much of it is desert, ice caps, and tundra. It's treeless mountain ranges. Only 3% is habitable for man. I do not believe that the pre-flood world only had 3% that was inhabitable for man. I believe that God created the world for man to live in. Here's a quote from Fossils of Dinosaurs in Antarctica. It says, The discovery of thousands of well-preserved leaves in Antarctica has sparked a debate among geologists over whether the polar region, rather than being blanketed by a massive sheet of ice for millions of years, enjoyed a near-temperate climate as recently as three million years ago. And we, of course, coming from a biblical worldview, would say that this was pre-flood. We find other quotes where it says, In January, Mr. Webb with David Harwood, an associate professor of geology at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, and Barry McKelvey, a professor of geology at the University of New England in Australia, said that there were deposits of leaves on the side of a cliff in a desolate stretch of the Trans-Antarctic Mountains about 250 miles from the South Pole. So here we have leaves 250 miles from the South Pole. Here we have another quote. Huge deposits of coal... In Antarctica, Antarctica was covered by ancient swamps. And then we have palm tree fossils have been found in Alaska. So there's a lot of evidence to suggest that we had a, worldwide, we had a tropical or temperate climate. A man who worked for an oil company in Barrow, Alaska, drilled through a thousand feet of permafrost and then drilled straight through a tree 300 foot tall standing up, buried during the flood, no doubt. The pre-flood world was mainly tropical even at the poles is what we can gather from this. And we wouldn't say this happened billions of years ago or hundreds of millions or millions of years ago. We'd say this happened pre-flood. Okay, there's no reason why we can't interpret the evidence like that. What were the animals like pre-flood? This is U.S. soldiers holding a camel spider in Iraq. Look at the suction cups on that thing. Okay, there, there, were a lot of, there was a lot more diversity before the flood. And not only did humans have a genetic bottleneck, all the animals did too, because they weren't, they weren't relegated to eight people to rebuild. They were relegated to a male and a female, except for some of the, some of the holy animals, which they brought in by sevens. 30 to 36 inch dragonfly fossils have been found. And how'd you like to have one of those hit your windshield, driving down the road at 60? We didn't feel that just saying that did enough justice, so we actually built one, and we usually put it up, put it up as a prop. We have huge cockroaches today, I think those are probably two or three inches long. But that's nothing compared to what we had pre-flood. We had 18-inch cockroaches. Holy cow. Honey, come kill this cockroach in the kitchen. All right, Betsy, I'm going to shoot this eight-foot centipede. All right, so we have huge animals. Two-foot-long grasshoppers. John the Baptist would have made a whole meal out of one of those. I wonder how big the bumblebees were that made the honey back then. Good question. 
Fossils of giant tarantulas have been found. That doesn't include its legs. That's just the body of the tarantula. That must have been enormous. And by the way, pre-flood, would you have feared these animals? I don't think that you would have. I don't think God made us to live with these giant animals to live in fear. Also, that we had a whole section, we had a whole 20-minute section when Rich and I first created this presentation on giants in the Bible. We talked about King Og of Bashan and, and uh, Goliath. David killed Goliath, and, but we took it out because we didn't have enough time. It's fascinating, though. So there, there were obviously people that were quite a bit larger as well that we just don't have the genetics for anymore. Um, not only were the bugs bigger, there were a lot of animals that were huge. We have a moose and a donkey and a, you know, all kinds of animals. It seems like they were larger versions of it, real, real similar, or just like the versions that we have today, only bigger. And I want to know where a 20-foot camel fits into camel evolution. I thought we are supposed to be getting bigger, better, stronger, and wiser. And it seems like we're getting smaller, not quite as bright, and not quite as good, not quite as healthy. I think that's biblical, but it doesn't fit in with the evolutionist worldview. Here's a Lepidodendrum club moss. It grows maybe 16 inches, maybe 18 inches today. There it is, 120 foot tall in the fossil record. Giant sharks. And then we have a crocodile there that stands six foot tall. That crocodile would be about that tall, 40 foot long. Enormous beast. And we have cattails 60 foot tall, and we find 747s in fossil record too. <laughs> a donkey was excavated near in Lubbock, Texas that was nine foot high at the shoulder. So that would be... I'm not even that tall, but that's a big donkey. Fossil bison horns have been found with 12-foot span. How come we don't have these any longer? You know, where it seems like we're losing a lot of genetic material that we once had. That's contrary to evolution. The rhinoceros is 18 feet tall. Man, that's huge. A 1,545-pound rodent, a guinea pig. Three-quarter of a ton guinea pig. How'd you like to have that as a house pet? This is one of my favorites. It's a giant prehistoric goose which stood as tall as an elephant and weighed up to half a ton. It brings whole new meaning to the word Aflac. And a fossil beaver is eight foot long have been found. So we went over to Joe Taylor's museum out in West Texas here. He's a really great man. He's got a small museum out there, but basically because he knows all of the ranchers out in the area, he goes out and gets fossils. And this is one of the fossils he found of a beaver. He has salamanders there that are six feet long, he's, and he's found some that are as large as 15 foot long. Uh, they're called metaphosaurs. We have sharks that are over 40 feet long, and we, by the way, sharks are mainly cartilage so that they don't fossilize, and so all we have of them are their teeth, but based on the teeth size, we can extrapolate how big they were. You find huge turtles, enormous ones, as big as VW bugs. So why aren't, aren't giants alive today? Well, representative kinds perished in the flood, is possible one reason. Ice age and or different climate flood took toll on larger insects and animals. And man may have killed off the giant insects and animals post-flood. They might have been a good source of food. And Leviticus 11.22 says that insects are kosher to eat if you're Jewish. <laughs> Not that I've, I doubt very many of them today take that seriously. But we do have some giant animals that are pretty big. We have the atlas moth, which is 12 inches wide. And we have goliath beetle, which is 100 grams. And so those are pretty big. But we seem to have lost some, a lot of the genetic material for the really, really huge ones. What about dinosaurs? Dinosaurs were big lizards that lived with Adam and Eve. And we're going to talk about this in Ancient Man and Dragons. So you'll have to come to that presentation. Act 2, A Flood of Biblical Proportions. I've mentioned before, I do not believe in a local flood. I believe it was a worldwide flood that covered the earth and destroyed everything that had the breath of life. It's funny to me how atheists can believe in Noah's flood on Mars, but they don't believe in a flood on the earth. In 1997, a quote that says, A flood of biblical proportions enough to fill the Mediterranean Sea gushed down from the highlands of Mars a billion or so years ago. The latest pictures from the Pathfinder confirmed to Monday always find it fascinating how they can believe in a, in a, when there's all kinds of evidence here for a worldwide flood and they don't believe in one. And then they look at evidence up there, which they're millions of miles away from, and they happen to believe in it. Genesis 7, 11 to 12 says, In the 600th year of the Noah's life, in the second day of the month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the deep, great deep burst forth and the windows of heaven were opened. Look how specific. We, we have the exact day that Noah went into the ark. It's a historical account, not mythology. Noah was 600 on the 17th day of the second month. ER when he went to the ark. ER is the Hebrew month. We know it exactly. 
And it's actually interesting. If you map that out, ER falls right between April Fool's Day and Earth Day. <laughs> Which is kind of interesting. I would propose we have International Flood Day on April 17th there. Now, flood stories outside the Bible. There are a lot of flood stories. This is Dinosaurs by Design by Dwayne Gish. If you have young kids, I would encourage you to get it. He mentions that there are 270 different flood stories around the world in different cultural groups. Here's Hawaii. Uh, long after the death of, the, of Kuni Hunahana, the first man in the world became a wicked, terrible place to live. There was one good man left. His name was Nu'u. What does that sound like? Noah, maybe? He made a great canoe with a house on it and filled it with animals. The waters came up over all the earth and killed all the people. Only Nu'u and his family were saved. Well, that's exactly what the Bible says, isn't it? Pretty close. The Bible gives more details. It's not oral tradition. It's written down history, so you'd expect that. Chinese. The Chinese are touted to have some of the most accurate records in, of any civilization, and they may be right. This history records that Fuhi, his wife, three sons, and three daughters escaped a great flood. He and his family were the only people alive on the earth. After the great flood, they repopulated the world. The Mao tribe, southwest China, says God destroyed the whole world by the flood because of the wickedness of man. Nua, well, I thought Nu'u was close, but Nu'u seems even closer. The righteous man and his wife, Matriarch, their three sons, Lohan, Loshin, and Jehu, Ham, Shin, and Japheth, survived by building a very broad ship and embarked on it with pairs of animals. The patriarch Jephu got the center of nations. The son he begat was the patriarch Gomen. Okay, so we have a lot of details given here that directly parallel the Bible. It seems like it's not just a mythology, it's actual history. These seem to also confirm that the Bible is true. The Toltec account is interesting. For the first world that lasted 1,716 years and was destroyed by a great flood that covered even the highest mountains. Well, you can add up how long it was, and they're only about 70 years off, the pre-flood time that the Bible says. It's interesting that because the Chinese, you know, they have a communist government that denies God right now. But it seems like there's a lot of things, and there's an entire book on this, but there's a lot of things built into their language, built into, because they use pictures for words, built into their language. The Chinese character for big boat is this, and it's actually a, a combination of three different words, vessel, eight, and persons or mouth. And that is the word for big boat. <laughs> I wonder where that came from. The following is analysis of over 200 flood traditions all over the world. And it's amazing the amount of continuity you have over these flood traditions, considering how many different sources you have and how spread apart they are. Is there a favored family? 88%. Were they forewarned? 66%. Is the flood due to wickedness of man? 66%. Is a catastrophe only a flood? 95% of the 200 flood legends have that. Was the flood global? 95% of the 200 flood legends have that. Is the survival due to a boat? 70%. Were animals also saved? 67%. Did animals play at any part? 73%. Did survivors land on a mountain? 57%. There's an amazing amount of continuity in between it. There's a lot of evidence that suggests that the Bible, a biblical account of the flood is not just mythology. It's got to be actual history. And uh, the Bible dates put the flood at 1656 years after creation. The Toltec count is only 60 years off after 4,400 years of history. One of the major things that you will hear from people is that the biblical account is from the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is the Babylonian account. And they'll say, well, the Bible was just derived from this Babylonian account. It doesn't appear that that's the case because the Bible gives much, much more details and, it's much, much, and it holds a lot more scientific water than... <laughs> the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh. Epic of Gilgamesh had a cube for the Ark, which is completely hydrodynamically unstable. It would flip around and anima, and Noah and his family would have never made it. Okay? They were on this Ark for 371 days. So the, the, it doesn't hold any water. There was a girl, she wrote an entire thesis on this, and she came to the conclusion that, that this, just, this critique of Genesis just isn't the case. Is the Ark feasible? Evolutionists love to poke fun of the Ark. How are you going to get all those animals on there? How are you going to take care of them? How are you going to feed them for that long? So we need to cover that. What does the Bible say about the ark? Well, there's a lot of details given. It's made of gopher wood. It has rooms. It has pitch inside. It's 437 foot by 44 foot by 73 foot. It has lower, middle, and upper decks are described in Scripture. And it has a roof. Genesis 6.21 says, You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. So we even told him to bring food on there because it's going to be a long trip. Skeptics insist that you have to bring a million animals onto the ark, including worms and other animals that he did not take on the ark. 
He, he took the animals that God told him to take. How many animals? That's a good question. That's a question a lot of people ask. Genesis 6.20 says, Bring two of every kind of bird, every kind of animal, and every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. And God brought these animals to him. He didn't have to go around catching them in nets and stuff. So the question is, how many created kinds are there? And it's a fairly difficult thing to calculate. <laughs> I mean, it's very difficult, especially at that time because we've had a lot of species die. But there's estimated 8,000 created kinds and multiply by two for male and female, and you've got 16,000 animals on the ark. So there were land animals and birds. There were no sea creatures. And bugs are not formally on the list of animals that were brought up the ark, but I guarantee you they were stowaways. Okay, so that's how we get the bugs. Genesis 6, 20 and 21 says, And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark and keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds according to their kinds, of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come in to you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and stored up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. You don't need to take 250 different kinds of dogs to represent dog kind. Okay, we're going to talk about natural selection, speciation, and biology. So come for that one. You just need to take an animal that has quite a bit of a variation in its genetic makeup. Remember, you've got dominant recessive genes, so there's genes that you carry that you don't express. And because God was selecting the animals, he could have chosen the exact animals he wanted to repopulate the earth, and I think that's what he did. I think that's what the Bible says. And from those two original dogs, you can get basset hounds and mastiffs. As unbelievable as it seems. Although you don't want to take these on the ark. They're degenerate mutants, and they're both males, so they'd have a problem repopulating. The next thing that people say is that the ark, it's not structurally sound, it's a bad design, it's going to break. There's a great book, Noah's Ark of Feasibility Study, which talks about this. It is an amazingly detailed book. Uh, chapter 1 talks about which part of the animal kingdom was on the ark. Chapter 2, floor space allotments for the animals. Chapter 3, quantities of food and water. Chapter, and they actually have calculations. They've estimated the number of tons of each of this stuff. And they've looked at how much tonnage the ark could carry. And they've looked at this in detail. This isn't just a small document. It's actually back there if you want to look at it. Uh, Chapter 4, waste management, vermin control. Chapter 5, heating, ventilation, and illumination. Chapter 6, ark construction. Chapter 7, the gathering of animals. Manpower studies. Eight people care for 16,000 animals, yada, yada, yada. Chapter 28, the restoration of of variation in mitochondrial DNA. So it goes in way in depth, and I'm not even going to talk about that. There's another great resource, worldwideflood.com. This is a great site to go to, and it's free. And they basically have also taken information from that, from Noah's Ark of Feasibility Study, and built on it. They've got joint construction. They've done studies on gopher wood and pitch, ship stability, actual construction of different components of the ark. You know, here's bilge wall connections, window construction, roof buckling, water pressure, wall bending, construction of roof, door design. Then they've done CAD and CFD analysis on it. And this guy's a mechanical engineer, and he actually does shipbuilding for a living. And so he's well-suited for doing this type of research. And he basically has done all kinds of research in this. And he's come to the conclusion that the Noah's Ark is an entirely feasible story. It can absolutely happen. There's nothing in there that, that precludes it from being a possibility scientifically. So the question is, how did Noah fit 16,000 animals on the Ark? That's a question that, that everyone asks. And when you got pictures like this in children's books, it makes you wonder. Rich's seven-year-old daughter... Said, said, Dad, how did, how did those rhinoceroses get their hineys through the door? And if a seven-year-old is asking the question, it, there's something wrong. You, you should make sure you buy books for your kids that are factually accurate. Go to Answers of Genesis, Institute for Creation Research, or Creation Ministries International and get books. But here they go again with, and I assume this is somewhat of a Christian book because it's about the flood. And here he, here's Noah and his family going around trying to catch the animals. He didn't do this. God brought them to him. Here's a quote from Noah's Ark of Feasibility Study, chapter 6, page 47. It is obvious that far from being overloaded, there is plenty of extra space on the ark beyond that which has been accounted for in the study. This amounts to a surplus of 6,000 tons of cargo. So he, by his estimates, he's got extra room on the ark. <laughs> okay, so it's perfectly feasible to have an ark fit all those animals. You can go through his calculations. You can rework them if you've got a couple of hundred extra hours. Uh, there's great resources. Noah's Ark Feasibility Study, the Genesis Flood, and the World That Perished by Whitcomb. Were there dinosaurs on the ark? Here's another question that, that I often get. Okay, I love Billy Graham. Okay, I want to clarify this. The first time I did this, the pastor was like, oh, you're going to alienate everyone. You need, to not, you need to take this out. Okay, I love Billy Graham, but 
as a man, he is, he is fallible, and he's not always correct. And I want you to be like the brains. If I say something that you don't agree with, I want you to, to look in Scripture and to see if it's right or not. Okay? We should be doing that with everything everyone teaches because we are fallible humans and prone to error. As iron sharpens iron, we should sharpen each other. And here's, the, here's an exact question where, animals on the ark, where dinosaurs on the ark was po- posed to Billy Graham. Here's the answer he gave. But no, Noah's ark apparently did not include dinosaurs. The reason is because dinosaurs and similar ancient creatures that we only know now from fossils were extinct. This is purely based on a bias or presupposition. It is not based on the biblical account. Okay, I love Billy Graham. Genesis 6.19, And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. He brought two of every sort. I believe dinosaurs were alive at the time, so that includes dinosaurs. After his kind, after their kind, after his kind, after his kind, of every sort, wherein is the breath of life. It's pretty redundant. So the question is, how did he fit all those 60-ton dinosaurs on the ark? Here's our resident skeptic here. It's important to realize that dinosaurs had a huge range in size. Some dinosaurs were as small as chickens. Other dinosaurs were enormous. The Argentinosaurus, guess where he was found, was 100 tons. A blue whale, just for comparison, is 120 tons. Okay, and that's his vertebrae. All we found is the vertebrae, and it stands five foot tall. So this is an enormous animal, and it takes, and it, it takes a lot of mass to warrant a vertebrae that size. That's one vertebrae. Within the kinds, there are various sizes. The Bible doesn't say that God brought the biggest of every kind. He didn't go out necessarily and get the biggest one, although with all that extra space, maybe he could have. It's also interesting that the average size of a dinosaur was the size of a goat. So it's possible, and the Bible doesn't say this, but it's possible that God could have brought Noah younger animals. What was their purpose? Their purpose was to repopulate the earth, and younger animals would be better able to do that because they'd have more time to produce kids. So it just makes sense. Just make sure you get a pink one and a blue one so you have enough genetic diversity afterwards. Why did God send the flood? Genesis 6, 5 through 8 says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of his thought, of his heart, was only evil continually. People look at some of the things that God does in the Old Testament and they say there's no way this is a good God. I think the case is that we force God's hand by our sin to do things that he really does not want to do. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Our sin had grieved God, or their sin had grieved God, and our sin continues to grieve God. The Lord said, I will blot out man from whom I created, from the face of the earth, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And so things are exceedingly bad by Noah's time. Adam died, and you've had a lot of generations, and man has gotten worse and worse and worse. And something has to be done. Genesis 6, 11, 12 it reiterates that prior passage says, The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence, and God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. God said unto to Noah, Nu'u, The end of all flesh has come before me. The earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. So here we see God's provision. God has, prov- God has already promised that the seed of woman will crush the head of the serpent in Genesis chapter 3. And he's going to fulfill that. God is true to his word. There's three things to consider concerning why he sent a flood. Because God could have snapped his fingers and had all the bad people just disappear. He could have opened up the ground and had them fall into the ground. But he chose to, to send a flood. I think the flood left evidence where a miracle would not. Uh, the effects are here for all to see and be reminded of God's judgment on sin. When we walk around and we see limestone and we see all the fossils in limestone, we need to be reminded that God doesn't tolerate sin. And uh, he scourges those he loves and he chastises every child he receives. And so I think, I think we, should be, we should mourn when we see that. The warning time also gave them a chance to change their minds. God gave uh, Noah 120 years to build that ark. And Noah and the New Testament calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. And so, God, so Noah was preaching to those people, trying to convert them for that entire time. And I think that's a testament to God's mercy, that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all men should come to a knowledge of him. Genesis 6.3, Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide with man forever, for he is flesh, his day shall be 120 years. Sometimes people think that this is talking about the longevity of man, that man's only going to live 120 years, that's it, he's not going to live longer than that. I do not believe this is the case. How long, 
How long were they living after the flood? How long was it? How old was Abraham when he died? 175. That interpretation is preached a lot, but it just doesn't hold water. So this is basically talking about the, the period of time that God gave Noah to build the to build the ark. And this is in Genesis chapter six, where God's telling Noah to build the ark. So it fits in context, and uh, in context there. So it's not how long man's going to live. We could live past 120. So this is what you need to think of when you think of the flood. The flood was an enormous, catastrophic event. Lots of water, lots of destruction. Uh, This is a picture of what the coast in Asia looked like before the tsunami that hit a couple of years ago. That's one wave. There's another picture of it. That's one wave on one day. Genesis 7 says this, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the day that all the sources of the watery depths burst open, the floodgates of the sky were opened, and the rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. The deluge continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. The water surged, and here we have the first mention of surging. Notice how many times surging is mentioned here. The water surged and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the waters. And the water surged even higher on the earth, and all the mountains... Under the whole sky were covered. The mountains were covered as the water surged above them more than 20 feet. The water surged on the earth 150 days. The water surged. What do you, I think that those were probably tsunamis. As, as the earth was moving, tsunamis were occurring, and the water was gushing up on land day after day, time after time, day after day, for 150 days. With that kind of thing, God is true to his word. When he says he's going to destroy everything that has the breath of life, he means it. And just to reiterate, here's, this was one wave. Okay? There was nothing left after the Genesis flood. Genesis 8 says, And God caused the wind to pass over the earth, and the water began to subside. The sources of the watery depths and the floodgates of the sky were closed, and the r- rain fell from the sky. The water steadily receded in 150 days. The ark came to rest, and the earth was dry. So here we have a general timeline. It's amazingly specific how this is. It tells the exact times Noah released these birds. Um, and the birds came back carrying different things, and he, he could figure out you know, when, the dry, when it was time for him to, to leave the ark. And so we have Noah on the ark for 371 days. It's amazingly specific. Okay, this last thing. I didn't know if we'd have time to get through it, but apparently we do. Pangea. Someone mentioned Pangea last time. There's a section on Pangea, and here it is. The earliest reference to this peculiar graphic feature was made by the English ph- philosopher Francis Bacon in his Novum Organum in 1620. And also the French naturalist George Le- Louis Le- Leclerc, Count de Buffon, and Francis Paget, he stated in 1666 that an undivided continent existed before Noah's flood. So he has a biblical worldview. And in 1666, before gradual plate tectonic theories came about, he was hypothesizing that the world was one landmass. Antonio Snyder Pellegrini said this, The first credible proponent of continental drift was Antonio Snyder Pellegrini, a belated advocate of catastrophism who in 1858 ascribes the biblical flood of the former existence of a single continent that was torn apart to restore the balance of a lopsided earth. Well, if he's the first one in 1850, this guy's talking about in 1666. Why are you neglecting him? Just because he has a biblical worldview doesn't mean he didn't have a good idea. This is 1-9. There, there's some evidence in Scripture... I say some because there's not a lot of evidence that, that there was one continent before the flood. Genesis 1.9 says, And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. So if the waters are gathered together in one place, that means the rest of it must be a continent. Psalms 33, 6 and 7 says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. He gathered the waters up as a heap. He puts the deeps in, it, in storehouses. So here we have another King David wrote another psalms. There are also some evidences for a single landmass. When you look at fossils, what, what you see here is there's sort of continuity of fossils that we can see when you put the sort of continents together. And also a zebra stripe pattern of magnetic reversals parallel to mid-ocean rip floor rifts in the volcanic rock form along the rifts, implying seafloor spreading along the rifts. So there's evidence that the continents have moved sometime in the past. And they either moved over millions of years or they moved very quickly. Okay, there's two ways of viewing it. There's man's theories, which say continental drift assumes it's always been the same, very slow rate. It only happens over millions of years. And there's continental sprint, rapid rate, then slow rate. Okay, so here we have the continents sprinting away from each other. 
I don't think God created the world with cracks and crevices and volcanoes destroying animals. So I, I think that things were different before the flood. But there's basically three types of movement there's in, uh, when you're talking about plate tectonics. There's transform faulting, extension divergent deformation, and compression deformation. And basically what we had, and if you look at the, going all the way from Chile all the way up to Canada, we see mountain ranges. Those mountain ranges came from one continent basically sliding underneath another one, subducting under another one. And it went all the way to the mantle and then pushed it up. And there's no way to get that amount of mass moving up gradually. You need some, you need some momentum behind it to get the mass moving up. Um, there's, there's studies done on that. There's a lot of studies that are done with what actually happened in the Earth during the flood. And uh, the Earth's magnetic field is generated in the Earth's magnetic core, most of which is molten, with viscosity near that of water. It's hot, hot, hot down there. So you have rock that's so hot that when you pour it, it pours like water. And so during the flood, you had one continent subducting under another one. You had the molten mantle was getting disturbed. That disturbing changed our magnetic field. And so that's why we assume the magnetic field was a lot stronger sometime in the past. So we have a lot of magnetic reversals occurring during the flood, which is there sort of in the middle. So when lava spewed up out of these crevices underneath the ocean and solidified, it adopted whatever the magnetism was at the time of the Earth. And that's why we see magnetic reversals. And there's a lot of really good guys. This is Dr. Baumgartner. We actually emailed him and talked about the magnetic reversals, and he has a great finite volume program, which is a three-dimensional program for modeling plate tectonics. All the other models take into account nine parameters. His takes into account 12. And the reason he takes the extra three into account is because the reason they, the, the atheists do not take the other three parameters into account is because they would come up with catastrophic plate tectonics, like he did. And they, because of their bias and presuppositions, want it to take a long time for the, for the continents to move. Okay, but he's got a great model, and not only does his model predict catastrophic plate tectonic movement, it also predicts where the floodwaters came from and, and a, a mechanism for the floodwaters flowing off of the land. Fascinating stuff. It's just really interesting stuff. And we asked him specifically in regard to, and he said about polarity, polarity reversals, are they real? And he said this, in regard to polarity reversals of the Earth's magnetic field, they are real. We asked him that to his face, and that's what he told us, and so we've got to believe that. Next week, more flood and post-flood.